Okay, <clears throat> I will go ahead and uh, and start a little bit of quick PowerPoint lecture for you here. Uh, and this is essentially what we would have been talking about if we've been having class. Um, this is looking at uh, another case from archaeology, and this is a classic Maya collapse. And as, a, as you know, it's an ongoing question that archaeologists have worked with for a long time, and we are still trying to figure it out. So here, let's have a look. Okay, one of the um, big surprises in the 19th century was the discovery of lost cities, uh, completely covered by jungle in, uh, in Yucatan and Chiapas. And this was a picture you're looking at here is actually classic watercolor uh, done by to the proto-archeologists in the 19th century, Stephens and Catherwood, who explored uh, the Maya areas and um, discovered or rediscovered these lost cities. This made a big imprint in people in the 19th, early 20th century because, of course, this was the period when, ideologically, everybody was thinking about progress being inevitable. You, know, you can't stop progress. And this was a bit of a shock because it kind of looked like you could stop progress. You could have a flourishing urban civilization with literacy that completely collapses, disappears. The idea that things can go badly wrong um, came as a shock to people. And it still is a bit of a cautionary tale. So. One of the things to think about um, is about states generally is the rise of stratified state level societies is indeed spotty and uneven. Um, they only arise in a few places, but they do spread. Uh, eventually, they absorb the whole world and we live in one. But it's good to realize that as recently as 1850 or so, the majority of humans on the earth did not live in state societies. So state societies have social classes, inherited status, often highly developed control of very altered agricultural and extractive landscapes. Um, specialists are supported by agricultural surpluses generated by peasant farmers and collected by ranks of regional elites. The picture you're looking at here is a rather amazing piece of flint working. That thing is all made out of flint stone. And you can see what you're looking at there. It's an incredible bit of flint napping. If you really look at here, you can see there's a face. There's another one down over here. There's all this really elaborate stuff indicating a headdress and it's really big piece of flint. And so all of this has to be produced by very easy way. Uh, and they're really making it hard for themselves by doing all these, these little points. That's, that's really tough to do. Um, this is high art. It's really specialized. Uh, and it's the sort of thing that people probably spent um, their whole lives learning to do and maybe passed on from, from generation to generation. The other thing to think about with this, and one of the reasons why it's so cool, it's also very fragile. You drop this once, it's gonna break. Because flint is very much like glass in the sense that it's sharp, but it makes good stone tools. But also, wow, it's an easy brick. So the object you see there is probably, I would imagine trial number 97 was the guy trying to actually make this thing. So they're cool. But they are brittle. Uh, and this is a case of state societies as well. And one of the things which we know is that dark ages um, happen often. So a formation does occur and it becomes nearly universal, but it isn't something that always lasts. Okay, like many other Native American societies, um, the Maya were producing and dependent upon what the Iroquois called the three sisters, maize, beans, and squash. And this picture, you can see how they all come together with the maize providing the upright stalk, the beans going up on the maize stalk, and then the squash sprawling out uh, all on the ground to provide some shade and also some weeding. Also, as we talked about before, the beans provide nitrogen fixing, which the maize needs to survive. So it all comes together. The Maya are also literate. Um, this complex set of glyphs you're looking at here in one of the inscriptions um, is definitely literacy. It took people a long time, Western science a long time to figure it out, uh, in part because they didn't realize that this was essentially um, a version of the Maya languages, which is still spoken in the region. This inscriptions are all over different uh, Maya monuments, but the longest inscriptions tend to be associated with these big uh, stone stelae, slabs of rock, that you can see are really elaborately carved and have portraits of, of rulers and they have dates. So we can date these things very closely because the Maya calendar was one of the first things that people managed to translate. Um, over here on the uh, this side, you have a female ruler 
And she is, as you can see, very elaborately dressed, big headdresses, lots of inscriptions going on. She has in her hand one of these scepters, which may very well be one of those chip flip things. On the other hand, she's got a shield and she is being presented as a warrior. Uh, and this is certainly something which is, is a big thing about the Maya elites. Okay, this is a, a quick shot looking at modern uh, Maya language distribution. Uh, as you can see, there's a number of different languages that are closely related to each other. And the ones that are over here in, uh, in yellow tint are the ones which appear on the inscriptions. And again, the big breakthrough is the realization that the Maya civilization may have been collapsed and gone, but the Maya themselves weren't. And the language they were speaking, you can still speak down to the present, uh, is closely related to the language that turns up in the glyphs. So that was a big deal for us in the end of the last century to figure this out, so we were able suddenly to read their history. So Maya cities then are amazing things. Uh, they are very unlike the kinds of cities that you see in the old world. Uh, the classic Sumerian city with a, a very tightly uh, packed nucleus with a, usually a defensive wall around it. Uh, that's not what we're looking at here. We're looking at a ceremonial center you can see here with, and this is the site of Tikal reconstructed. Uh, you can see there's big pyramids sticking up there. There's plazas, uh, but also notice there's causeways going out in different directions here. And you can see there's these are actually linking together landscape. This whole landscape around the city core turns out to be have been heavily settled. So you're looking not at a city that just has a central core, but a city that sprawls out over many, many kilometers. And this is something we're recognizing now as a special kind of tropical city, uh, as similar to the sorts of things which you see in Cambodia uh, with Khmer, uh, the Khmer civilization there. So we're looking at a really complex landscape all tied together. And this is an image, a LiDAR image, which allows people to use laser from uh, the air to penetrate the dense forest and actually, well, we can see some of the stuff which we didn't see before. LiDAR imagery has actually uh, produced um, a real revolution in Maya studies. And you can see in this uh, uh, image, you can see all the causeways going out in different directions, the tremendous number of different pyramid platform mounds present. You can see a schematic showing you, this is what you see with the LiDAR taking the forest off, and LiDAR allows you to scan down to the surface through the vegetation and then allows you to electronically remove that vegetation, at least the image of it, and that's what you get. So you can see a whole bunch of stuff pops up, which is otherwise pretty hard to see. So this has really tremendously changed our understanding of the Maya and of their disguise and scope, their settlements. So again, here's a 3D view of the call. Uh, again, most of these pyramids we've known for many years. But some of the things out here um, were discovered just recently by doing the LIDAR scanning. So again, technology makes a big difference in terms of what you see archeologically, and especially in this case. So as we go out into landscape, um, you can see this pattern of house platforms and small temples linked together by causeways, and they're widely dispersed, but they're all interconnected. So what you're seeing here is, is these are agricultural fields here, and then here's settlement nodes going out into the landscape in all directions. So again, this tropical city pattern is one of a ceremonial core with then dispersed settlement connected to it going out in some distance into the landscape. Uh, the other thing which we're seeing increasingly uh, understanding the Maya is the extent to which commerce and trade was important to them. And especially in recent years, people have done a lot of work with looking at the marine aspect of the Maya, and again, the trade up and down the coast in different kinds of resources, animal skins, tools, ceramics, basalt, jade. These are all the sorts of things that we know that people exchange back and forth. So this is a, a landscape of cities that are often competing with each other, but they're also tied together uh, by trade and exchange. So this whole set of networks taking place here. Water is a big part of the story. In the Highland Zone, you have free-flowing water like the uh, Rio Santo Domingo you see here. But in the lowland zone, uh, you have a uh, limestone bedrock, uh, which is very porous. So the water rainfall tends to run right through it, and you can have real problems with drought. You also have 
solution chambers in the limestone, essentially big flooded caves, uh, the cenotes, the guadas, which uh, are water centers uh, permanently. And these are places that are very important to the Maya, uh, both because they were resources for irrigation, but also ritually. The Maya had strong beliefs about water as being an important uh, part of uh, the underworld. And so they sacrificed things by throwing them into the cenotes, uh, some really fine uh, Maya artifacts, and also people. Uh, so human sacrifice was very much part of this culture, as we'll see. Um, they also created things called chultunes, which are artificial um, cenotes or aguadas. So this is, again, uh, water control, water management. It's very much part of the story. So modern Maya agriculture involves both uh, intensive gardening and also what people talk about as itinerant agriculture or slash and burn. In this case, you can see some farmers who are burning off some landscape to clear it for planting. Uh, so fire is still part of the human ecosystem here. And as you can see in the caption, uh, in level terrains, the soil can be cultivated for about 15 years within a resting period. So in the Maya era, things were even more complex. Uh, a lot of effort was put into really major transformation of landscape. And again, this is the kind of thing that states do. You can see in this picture, this terracing here, uh, it allows much better water control, but imagine the amount of labor which is going into creating these terraces. So there's lots of different modifications which we're seeing the Maya doing to their landscape. They're moving water around, they're trying to maintain fertility. So they're very actively managing um, their production. And you can see the results of this still today in parts of the uh, area that have been deforested. This is a picture from Belize. And you can see the rectilinear patterns there in the ground. Those are Maya fields, now the remains of them. And you can see there's a causeway there present. Uh, so again, the modern vegetation, the dense rainforest that covers the area, mostly was gone by the time the Maya uh, reached their apogee. And you can see that this is actually was a very densely used, very densely populated landscape, not at all wilderness. Okay, so thinking about how people adapt uh, to anything, um, uh, how we deal with natural environment, it's good to recognize that if this is following a um, common schematic that people can use for a bit, that you have areas of values and belief, practical knowledge, and then what people actually do. So in this framework, Here's our symbolic reservoir. Uh, you can think about this as religion, as worldview, as your understanding of, of how the cosmos works. Uh, else you can think about it as providing cultural legitimacy. You obey the king because he's royal or you obey him because he's, he's sacred. Um, there's authority going here. So this is again, the social capital, which we've talked about before, as being critical for people to actually get things done. Then there's the social memory. This is the area of what have we done? What, what's the traditional way of handling a problem? If there's a drought, if there's warfare, what do we do? Uh, what have we done in the past? What do we know works? What do we think doesn't work? And again, what haven't we thought of? Because that's another thing to consider here is these are boundaries as well. And then the, the practical schemata can also be thought of your traditional ecological knowledge. And again, before we had science, we were all using TEK. And you can think of this as sort of a toolkit that you can reach into to try to pull out a, a solution to a problem. You know, you know how to do some kinds of water control, great, so that's what we're gonna do. Uh, you know how to build cities in some different fashion, so that's what we're going to do here. This is the toolkit that people have to work with. And then this allows you to interact with the world of social action. You've got your symbolic reservoir to justify and provide cultural legitimacy. You've got your social memory of how we've done things in the past. You have your practical toolkit. What are you going to use? And then you impact the natural environment around you. So we'll come back to this and think about it. Okay, one of the things to think about here also is that um, what they believed, um, and they believe very strongly that the gods needed human blood. Um, and without that, the sun wouldn't rise and the rains wouldn't fall. And here's two stelae showing elite people um, sacrificing, doing blood sacrifice. Here's a, a woman who is pulling a cord with thorns on it through her tongue. Ouch. Here's another stela. There's a, a high ranking lady who's doing the same thing. And next to her, her husband, the king, is pushing a stingray spine through his penis. Uh, ouch again. So this 
issues elite blood is more valuable than commoners' blood meant that the elites themselves were participating uh, in these human sacrifices, although it seems that plenty of commoners were sacrificed as well. And of course, enemy blood works fine. Here is a, uh, a steel, uh, or a painting rather from Bonham Park, and it shows uh, the Maya uh, victors and the vanquished. And the guys who have lost are having their fingers bled as part of a blood sacrifice, or eventually going to wind up getting sacrificed and killed. You can see they've been stripped of their regalia, and the winners, as you can see, are all really well made up with labels about who they are above them. So part of our story then uh, is about what people believed, uh, and of course, part of it's how they acted. Now, the classic Maya collapse is something which people have written about for a very long time. Uh, there's lots of literature out there. And one thing that people have come to realize, especially as radiocarbon dates uh, pile up and they supplement the inscription dates, which we have on the monuments, we can see that it actually winds up being something like a three-phase collapse. Uh, some areas go out earlier, some areas hang on for longer, and then finally you have uh, the phase three, uh, where most of the active areas are in the lowlands, and then they stop having inscriptions, and they, they stop being urban. Okay, so we have then the notion that this is a process, not just an event. It's not just a sudden thing, uh, but it's a more gradual collapse, absence in stages. Uh, so thinking about factors, people have talked about climate fluctuation, especially rainfall. Uh, the idea of agricultural overdevelopment, that people are pushing the soils of the Yucatan too hard, that they are pushing the limits of food production. Increasing warfare has been flagged up, both local warfare between Maya centers and also warfare between the highlands in Mexico and the lowlands, the Maya region. Increasing social inequality has also been flagged up. Um, the Maya elites seem to have been getting more elite with time and more distant from the local population supporting them. And then, of course, the question just simply demands for tribute for human sacrifice, construction cost. Uh, human sacrifice has been estimated hit something like 10,000 people per year. So this is not a small thing to uh, defeat the, the gods happy. Construction costs are also something to think about. Uh, Maya uh, pyramids and other big structures were regularly renewed, were rebuilt on a, on a regular cyclical basis. Uh, so whether they need it or not, the whole outside would be uh, renewed, a whole other building essentially, but sort of over the existing one. So Maya structures tend to be multiple, multiple structures, one on top of another. And they all needed to be plastered uh, with uh, uh, burnt uh, lime. And this, of course, required fuel. So some calculations for what it talk, took to, to redo the big monuments you're seeing there in Tikal suggest that many, many hectares would be have to be deforested just to produce the fuel to produce uh, the, the white uh, coating. So there you go. So there's generally a sense of increasing human footprint and consumption resources and the issue of natural and social capital reserves. Again, we talked about natural capitals being things like soils, like wood, like animals, and the social capital, again, being what people are willing to put up with, what are they willing to believe. So this gets us thinking also about what people talk about as pathways and rigidity traps. And this is, again, borrowing heavily from the Resilience Alliance folks and their um, their vocabulary, but some of these things are just sort of common sense. Past choices do limit future options, you know, for good or for bad. You're selecting one pathway for many, and then as you keep doing it, you know, as you keep going down that same path, repetition makes that groove deeper. And as people have argued, it makes it harder to select other options. The inherited cultural environmental landscape can be both burden and an opportunity. It makes it harder to change pathway trajectory and to adapt to change. So if you've been doing something for hundreds of years and suddenly that's not working, um, getting out of that rigidity trap may be tough or impossible. Also, the definition of a cultural acceptable option can be narrowed and contested. Again, get back to thinking about those, those multiple layers um, of authority and uh, knowledge, the toolkit. So again, what's okay to do in a culture? What's not okay to do? Is polygamy okay or is it not okay? Uh, what's the breadth of your diet? So stratified states like the Maya like stability on the longest term. 
and they may resist as well as promote innovation, thus creating what people talk as rigidity traps. This is, this is what we're doing, this is the only thing we're gonna do, and other options are not possible. Also, elite self-interest may diverge from the best interests of society as a whole, and certainly we can see examples of that right now in the modern world, uh, but that also happened in the past. So increasing social inequality has adaptive costs. This is one big takeaway from lots of archaeological studies of you know, collapse of one kind or another, is that it is not necessarily all about just environment or climate. It's also about society, that social capital issue. Okay, so one of the things which happens also is warfare intensifies the Maya period, both within the Maya area and with invasions from the highlands, perhaps the Toltec civilization, which we know about uh, in highland Mesoamerica. You can see an example of the impact of this on these Maya cities, a small one, this Dos Pilas. We know that between uh, AD 760 and 761, you know, very suddenly, you go from having a pattern like this, we have a fairly typical Mesoamerican elite center here with, with all sorts of people living out in the countryside. And you can see there's an elite residence here, there's a couple of pyramids, there's a central plaza here where there's a market, and also there's some steel eye set up, and look what happens here. Down here, everybody from the countryside now is packed into that plaza. Uh, a bunch of the buildings inside are demolished or repurposed during military. You can see that they put a wall around, and the wall is cutting right through what had been the elite residences here. So they are they are hunkering down, and they're fortifying. So again, you can see the sense of of insecurity here. This is a landscape which has gone from being peaceful and fairly secure to being dangerous. And for the farmers, uh, the only way they're going to survive is behind those walls. The other thing we see happening uh, artistically is the Tlaloc rain god's image is multiplying. Here's Tlaloc. He's got his long nose, his goggle eyes. He's kind of fierce looking. And he's the rain god. He brings rain to come. And we know that these images were connected to increasing human sacrifice, um, including children. Tlaloc apparently liked the cries of small children. Um, not a nice guy, but um, he's your rain god. So these images are multiplying, and it's been suggested that they're reflecting um, drought, an attempt to ritually um, attract water. And this is, of course, one of the things the elites are supposed to do, is to keep uh, the gods happy through blood sacrifice and other rituals, and to make sure the talk brought the rain. And if he didn't, well, the question is who's responsible for that. So then we have a bunch of paleoclimate work. Uh, this is showing a paper from a few years ago from the Lake Chichen Kanab on the Yucatan Peninsula. What it's doing here is using a bunch of different indicators uh, in sediments to take a look at periods of drought associated with the period of the collapse. So certainly there's multiple indications that you are seeing a prolonged drought or occurring drought taking place in the Maya area associated with this, this gradual progressive uh, falling apart. And deforestation is also part of the story. In this case, um, you can see from the, the um, caption that the NASA scientist Ben Cook was doing modeling for what happens if you deforest um, Mesoamerica. And what comes out of that was that the climate winds up being um, warmer and drier than it would have been if the trees had still been there. So part of the cycle you're seeing is actual climate change, but some of it is because of deforestation. You're seeing the greater impact of any droughts are going to happen. So again, deforestation doesn't cause a drought, but amplifies natural droughts when they occurred. Okay, things happen. There's deliberate defacement and destruction. They literally chop the faces off a bunch of these steli. Um, rolled. Certainly we have a bunch of Maya centers which are burned down and they're not, re not rebuilt. So this is, um, something's happening. Significantly, there's the end of what they call the long count dates. So the way we are able to date these monuments is by using long count inscriptions um, on the monuments themselves. They stop doing it. Glyph inscriptions on stone are probably gone. They may not necessarily be a loss of literacy entirely because we know that people still were writing on paper and uh, bark, uh, creating codices, which unfortunately the Spanish gathered up and burnt um, when the contact period occurred. So we have then not a total loss of everything associated with civilization, but certainly a loss of urbanism and a loss of certainly loss of population 
Uh, they do not become extinct, but boy, they they take a hit. And significantly, they stop having state level civilization. So this is a collapse of the state. And people are arguing that maybe what you're seeing here is in fact the uh, loss of social capital uh, really triggering this. It's not that the Maya are giving up when the last corn cob is eaten. Um, they're not. They're bringing down their real rulers and they're destroying um, urbanism uh, as, a, as a way of life. So there is a post-classical survival down to the Spanish conquest in the 17th century. Uh, it isn't totally rural. There are small centers still there, but there's nothing as big as Tikal uh, or Calakmul or some of the other big centers which you talk about. So some things to think about here is, again, big question, what did it? We do not certainly have it all worked out, but this I think can get us some, towards some ideas of what people are thinking about. Did drought just kill the classic Maya? Or was it deforestation, overpopulation, revolt? Um, so are you gonna go down climate determinism routes? Uh, people have, but that may be seen as just a bit too simple. Uh, ideology and belief systems are certainly getting thrown in here too. The Maya have real problems in creating imperial systems that unite multiple towns, and the, the warfare just keeps cycling and cycling. Uh, if one of the centers had won and imposed a large-scale empire like the Akkadians did in Mesopotamia or much later the Romans did on so much of Europe, maybe it would have been different. Maybe if the warfare hadn't just continued at the local level, things would have been happening. So again, you're seeing op variables operating on different time scales coming together in what people talk about a conjuncture um, of big events happening, result of the coming together, different sorts of things happening, uh, small things happening perhaps on a different scale. Okay, so we can think about scales of interaction and people also talk about is the speed of these interactions. We'll talk about slow, medium, and fast variables. Slow variables are things that are taking place on the decadal to century scale Soil erosion, drain changes, geomorphology. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about is slow stuff happening over a long period, which may not necessarily be highly visible to the people living through it. Um, then you have sort of medium term things happening. What's the balance between collaboration versus violence? I mean, these city states were fighting each other, but they're also trading with each other. Uh, what about the impact of trade linkages and trade resource extraction impacts? Um, What's going on with loss of national capital as you burn down the trees, as you expand? You know, again, these are medium term kinds of things happening. Unintended consequences of landscape change are a big issue here. Deforestation in the highlands results in changes in water distribution, um, floods as well as droughts, uh, and these can be very damaging to agricultural systems. And then you have fast things, conquest. Somebody comes in and just burns down your city and you're all taken away as slaves for your sacrifice. Um, warfare. Uh, revolt also. Again, it does look as though many of the Maya centers ended up uh, not just being conquered by somebody else, although that happened, and then going ahead, they get destroyed and they're not reoccupied. And that really does look as though something has happened to the social system, not just to the individual city. And then, of course, weather events. You know, a really prolonged drought does have a real impact. So I think what we're talking about then is things coming together, this sense of a loss of resilience and conjuncture, conjuncture where multiple things are happening at once. So it's not just drought, it's not just warfare, it's all these things coming together. So a couple of points to think about is the Maya faced multiple droughts in their past and they survived. After all, one of the things which the society was good at was water management and complex agriculture. So the big question is why do the later droughts have the great impact? And again, this is a question, it isn't that everybody goes down at once. Why do some centers survive longer? And again, minus today studying these problems, we're increasingly talking about history and agency and this long-term human economics concept of these complex long-term interactions of people and land and climate and each other uh, through long periods. So we have then some interesting stuff to think about with the Maya collapse. And it's of course not all figured out and lots of very smart people are working on it uh, this day. Uh, but something I'd just like to throw up here also to think about is the USAID climate change risk profile for Guatemala. Um, this is something which USAID, USAID folks have been putting together for quite some time. But after um, the 2016 election, all of this was taken down 
and archived. So you can't actually see that very easily, but here's something to look at. And it talks about how Guatemala has made significant progress, but still struggled with high exposure to natural hazards, high rates of poverty, malnutrition, maternal child mortality, high rates of violent crime. But climate change poses even greater challenges to long-term development goals. And you can see in the second paragraph there, they're talking about um, the problems of food and water insecurity, especially for indigenous people, subsistence farmers, 40% of the population. And the end points that the 2015-2016 El Nino phenomenon led to one of the worst droughts in 35 years in Central America. And this, of course, is a reason why you have desperate people from Guatemala uh, trying to enter the U.S. Uh, and again, we've all seen pictures of this sort of thing. So climate change is part of the story for the ancient Maya, but it goes on being a story for their descendants who are also heavily affected by climate change. And of course, so is the rest of the world. So to close up with, I can recommend a book by Christian Parenti called Tropic of Chaos, Climate Change, the New Geography of Violence, uh, in which he talks about climate change and climate impacts. And this is, of course, <coughs> excuse me, one of his examples. So it's an interesting book. It's, it's a little scary, um, but it certainly does provide some perspective on connecting past and present uh, to modern issues. So that's the Maya, and that's our talk.